or other people who don't like chocolate here. Anyway, his strategy is driven by a clear goal, to produce more new products than anyone else has ever done in the industry. I mean, he's created chocolate handbags, chocolate glasses, I believe it's even a chocolate bed. Um, but he wants to be the chocolate industry's greatest innovator. I'm going to go and have some chocolate now. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome for Louis Barnett. Uh, it's great to be here. Before I start, like Savile said, um, I'm so happy to be here in Malaysia. Malaysia Ballet! Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's also my first trip to Malaysia. Um, I spend a lot of my time travelling now around the world. Um, and as was said, I, I've been in business a, a long time now. It's been eight years this September. Uh, my story is a little bit different than Savile's. Much like you guys, uh, my story started at the age of 11. Uh, I was at school and I couldn't understand why my friends seemed to be able to do their tests, exams, fine, not a problem. And I'd look at mine and go, why is it in Chinese? I can't, I can't read that, what's that? And all the way through my school life, I kept having problems and I found it difficult through every lesson. I found it difficult to remember, I found it difficult to read. And eventually, my teacher came to me and said that there's going to be a very big exam soon in the UK and we can't read your writing. You have to have some help. So I went away, I found a local teacher um, who took me on and in two lessons, she says to me, I think you've got dyslexia. My reaction, yes, no school. <laughs> um, and I obviously found out what dyslexia was, and get ready for this one. At the age of 11, I was diagnosed with dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, short-term memory loss syndrome, and a type of ADHD, which would kind of explain why I had so many problems at school. Um, now, that, all of that, you can look it all up online. I'm not going to stand here and explain in detail what they all are. Uh, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, they're all to do with reading, writing, numeracy, um, and the short-term memory loss means that I don't really remember things very well. ADHD me makes me a bit kind of high for some time, so I get a bit jumpy and loud on stage. Uh, but you know, from, from that age, um, maybe it was my hard time at school. When I was diagnosed with those things, and much like Sabra was saying, it's positivity. It was my first experience of positivity. I had a reason. The first reason why I had a problem at school. I had a, a vision of, okay, I'm obviously not academic, but maybe I'm meant to do something else. So only a matter of weeks later, um, now most of you probably believe that the UK education system is brilliant. Um, it's not. Um, and certainly when it comes to learning disabilities, Things have moved on a lot since I went to school, but they didn't really know how to deal with learning disability students. So after having a lot of problems, still in just six, six weeks of secondary school, my parents took me out for home education. I couldn't cope, I was being bullied, I was being bullied by teachers, by students, um, and they knew that if they didn't take me out of school, I, I would amount to nothing. Um, and to give you an idea, and this is a real figure in the UK, 55% of the UK prison population are dyslexic. That is a huge population that is being left out from school, is not correctly being educated because we learn in a different way. We learn in a tactile way and we learn from other people. So after coming out of school, uh, much like several of my parents were telling me that I needed to uh, be a, a writer or be a doctor or a lawyer and my dad wanted me to be an airline pilot actually which I, I didn't want to do. There's only two things I've ever enjoyed in my life and that's animals and cooking and that's it. So after many many arguments eventually my parents just gave up. They said oh just do what you want. Go on. Just tell us what do you want to do. And I started work at a falconry centre. So birds of prey, eagles, owls, that, that kind of thing, flying things. And um, I started work there, bearing in mind I'm still 11 years old, and I was working there voluntary. Now the guy I was working for didn't like kids at all, hated kids. And he tried to get rid of me for six months. And you know, I, I sat down and thought to myself for a long time, a lot like Sabo was saying, what am I going to do? 
I'm 11 years old, I'm not in school, I can't ever uh, succeed in academia, in school, in college, in university. What am I going to do? And I decided that I had to stick to something. This was an opportunity. I had to prove to me, to my parents, who were very worried about me, that I could do something with my life. So for the first time in my life, not only did I read one book, front to back, I read seven. And after six months of the guy trying to get rid of me, he says to me one day, Louis, you're obviously not going anywhere. So I want you to follow me around for the next couple of days. I'm going to ask you some questions about what you've learned while you've been here. I answered every single answer correctly, and I even corrected him on a few. And from that day, I became an apprentice in his business. My first real experience in the business world, I was doing invoices, I was running the shop, uh, and also, because I knew so much about it, when he was doing the bird of prey displays, a lot of people would ask me a question, and I'd be able to answer it straight away. And that's one thing I want to talk to you all about. One of the things that I get asked a lot is about confidence. And I was a very unconfident, shy kid. I'd had a lot of problems at school. But knowledge was my confidence. Somebody could ask me any question, it didn't matter what, about the birds of prey, and I could answer. And I realised that that's actually talking. It's what I'm doing here today. The only reason I'm on this stage is because I know about what I'm talking about. It's, it's not because you know all sorts of things going on in the UK. And she phones me up and she says, Louis, I want a chocolate cake for my 50th birthday. Right, okay, answer Jane. Um, how about a Victoria sponge? No, 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 no. I saw in a magazine and that's what I want. So I had to make this chocolate cake for her. I combined two recipes together of two very classic Belgian cakes. And I started making for her party. And then after the party, her friends loved the cake. And I got a phone call. And another one, and another one, and another one, and so on. And in about two months, I had 50 local clients buy my cakes. Now, to me, it was still a hobby. I was enjoying what I was doing, making some pocket money, which is always good. Uh, but I just enjoyed what I was doing. I didn't think about business. I didn't know about business. The only business experience I'd ever had was from this Vulcanry Centre. So without thinking, um, I started dealing with two local restaurants in the Delicatessen. And then one day, one of the chefs says to me, Louis, we love your cakes, we love the recipes, but we can't keep dealing with you unless you can invoice us. Invoice? Stop. Okay. Um, I got in contact with a local accountant, and he told me that through various processes, I could actually file to start what we call in the UK as a sole trader. So it's a small, independent business. And I did that at the age of 12. That made me the Europe's first, youngest entrepreneur. I didn't even know until two years later. So there's me making these cakes for family and friends, for local restaurants. And then one of the things that you all have on your side is naivety. Because we're young, we're full of energy, and we want to do something quick. As Sabro said, you don't think about it. You don't think about it too long and think, oh, it's not going to work, oh, I won't bother. Uh, and I was walking through my local supermarket in the UK, and I see a product on the shelf that I recognise from the local area. And I go to the store manager and say, I know that product, I'm a local guy, do you want some of my stuff? Huh? And he said, oh, it's a business card, go, go away. And I phoned up the supermarket, not knowing anything about how to do it. They told me that I had to send it down to the post room and, and everything else. And I got a very uh, aggressive phone call from some buyer's assistants, PAs, PA, PA, something. And they said to me, Louis, if you're really lucky, you might hear off this in six to eight weeks. I said, oh, okay, right, I'll forget about it then. So I went away on holiday. I come back home, and the phone's ringing. I pick it up. Hello, this is the head buyer of Waitrose here. Uh, <clears throat> Hello, sir. Uh, Louis, we love your product. When can you come and see us? Uh, this week? Yes, right, fantastic. Two days later, I was sitting with the head buyer of a supermarket at the age of 13. And I'll tell you, I will never, ever forget that day. The look on the guy's face when I walk in. He didn't know my age at this point. So I walk in, shake the guy's hands, my parents walk in, and then my parents walk out. And he's like, have they gone to the car to get something? 
Now this is my company. What? I'll never forget that day. That's when I realised that I was doing something unusual. So I became Waitrose, our second largest gourmet supermarket, youngest ever supplier at the age of 13 years old. So 13, I'm already supplying the second largest gourmet supermarket in the UK. And they gave me an order for 165 chocolate boxes, which I thought was huge, massive. And the first chocolate machine that I bought um, cost me about £30, which is, I think, about 600 ringgit, something like that. You'll have to forgive my maths. Um, but my nan lent me the money. She lent me £30 so I could buy my first machine. And then with this order from Waitrose, um, I had to buy a bigger machine, uh, which I did through a family friend who tied off the money for me. So I went from a, a, a little tiny machine to 15 kilograms, which I thought was like the biggest thing ever. I had to move from my kitchen into my garage, and I started making and producing. I just, just made the order for Waitrose. By the, the skin of our neck, we say in the UK, you know, so close. My dad and I drove all the way down to Waitrose at 6 a.m. and parked between 15 lorries, and we're in a Persia. Little car, there's an eight foot loading bay, I'm passing boxes up to my dad. And this the pallet was about that high. And I watched my pallet, my product, my passion, my energy, my baby disappear into Waitrose. And that's when I knew that this is it. This is my opportunity. If I don't take it, I'll regret it for the rest of my life. So I stopped doing everything else and just focused on the business. Now that's one thing about being a young entrepreneur. You see this side of us, you see the presentations, you see all the fantastic places we, we get to go to. I'm 6,715 miles away from home, or so my iPhone tells me. I'm all that way from home. But one of the things that I'll say to you is, being an entrepreneur will be, I guarantee right now as I'm standing here, the most exciting, exhilarating career you will ever choose in your life. But it will also be the hardest decision you'll ever make. At the age of 13 to say, I am only going to focus on my business, forget everything else, the risk of stopping education, the risk of losing family, all of that. And I didn't see any of my friends for three and a half years. I've been in business eight years now, and I've had nine weeks holiday, eight years. That's commitment. That's what you have to do to achieve in business. As Savril said, it's perseverance all the time. You have to be committed, you have to be passionate, and the passion drives you through because I've always said, and many entrepreneurs have said it before, you're only as successful as your biggest failure. You have to do a lot of things wrong to get them right. You always learn from what you're doing wrong. So then, just after the order at Waitrose, I went to go and meet Sainsbury's, our biggest UK supermarket. I actually met them at a trade show in a convention center. This strange woman comes up to me and she's She's looking with a clipboard like this. And then she points, she goes, Oh, you're that kid, aren't you? I think so. She says, Well, I'm Jane, I'm from Sainsbury's. Can you come up and do a presentation to our board of directors? Yep, no problem. So I go up, 14 years old, I'm doing a presentation to our largest UK supermarket. You all, any of you know Jamie Oliver? Okay. But well, he's their ambassador for Sainsbury's, very high quality supermarket. And at 14, I'm sitting with the managing directors of Sainsbury's. And after a couple of meetings, a very, keep this figure in your head, 165 chocolate boxes, January 2007, to Waitrose. Six stores in the UK, that's it. After a couple of meetings with Sainsbury's, I look at the buyer and say, what does this actually mean for my company? How many boxes do you want? She, she kind of looks over and she goes, gets a calculator, puts a few numbers in. Oh, well, I think about 350 stores, 60,000 boxes, is that all right? <coughs> yeah, fine, no problem. I go back to see my Waitrose buyer, and he wants 40,000. And all stores, all 185. So, there's a bit of naivety for you. At the age of 14, I have an order 
the Christmas of 100,000 chocolate boxes. I had to move into my first, I had my first factory when I was 14. It got opened by a local MP. Um, I moved straight in, I've got 10 local staff, two 100 kilogram chocolate machines, it's like a bat of chocolate, just going around here, Willy Wonka stuff. And we start making, and it's all about the passion, it's about the excitement of what we were doing, but prepared to put in the hard work as well. And the recipe that I did, and this is one thing that I'm very passionate about, it's all very well and good marketing and PR and my, at that point I was getting a lot of press in the UK. But if your product isn't good enough, if you don't really know about your product and your industry, somebody will only ever buy it once. The packaging might be fantastic. They open it, they taste it, they're not going to buy again. And no one, no business on this planet makes their money only from new customers. Always remember that. Business is about repeat customers. So for me, although we were dealing with the supermarket, we had huge quantities to do. The exact same recipe that I used to do on my kitchen table, my family home, was scaled up in my factory. The same recipe, the same ingredients and the same amounts. Everything exactly as it was and should be to make sure that my customers had the best product. The best ingredients creates the best product. That's one thing I want to put across to you. So I opened my factory, I was starting to get a lot of PR interest on the BBC, national TV, started to work in newspapers, wrote my first couple of articles, and then I suddenly realised that all of my knowledge that I'd gained so far was only from books, CDs, other people I could find, and I decided that it was probably a good idea to go away and get some solid tutoring. And I applied to go to the Banbury Chocolate Academy in the UK. Now, uh, Barry Caliban, the world's largest chocolate company, and although I went to them, I was only 16 at the time, the minimum age was 18, uh, sorry, 14 when I went to them, the minimum age was 16, they decided to sponsor me. Because of everything that I'd done, because of my, my business, how fast it had grown, they decided to sponsor me. But that had its own problems. I was 14 years old in an industry where everyone else, and I can tell you this, this is one thing as young people, you will all find out, starting your own business, getting into careers, the planet is very ageist. Everyone thinks, like Savrov said, you're 14, you can't possibly know what you're talking about. And that's where things began to change. Just like Savrov, somebody was pointing the finger and saying, you don't know enough about your product, you're young. And I decided to prove them wrong. I set out the goal to create more new products than anybody had ever done in the history of chocolate. Now, the history of chocolate, as we know it today, goes back about 700 years. So it's a long history in Europe. And I decided to create more new products than anybody had ever seen. And I said, okay, maybe I'll do it in three years. I did it in six months. Chocolate handbags, shoes, beds, furniture, glasses, martini, gla you name it. Everything that could be made out of chocolate, I did. And when everyone would tell me, oh, you can't make a glass out of chocolate because it'll leak, I made one that didn't. And for me, that, that knowledge of my industry, of, of what I was doing, and, and it's very much different in a physical product industry. It is product knowledge is essential. So I set out to be recognised in my industry. So I did it very quickly. It didn't take me long. It took me six months. I got awarded in the House of Lords in the Buildings of Parliament with an award for the Lord Carter Memorial Awards. Right. I've done that by the age of just, just sort of just past 15 years old. And I then sort of sat back and thought, well, you know, what, what now? I've done all this, it's, it's going fantastically. And slowly, and I couldn't work out why, my customers were starting to drop out. They were going bankrupt. Things were happening all the time. I was losing customers. And most of my customers that I phoned up were actually out of business. I thought, well, I've got to do something. I've done all this work, all this energy, and now what? And here's a problem for you, and this is something, if nothing else, I want to leave you with today. I have to stress more than anything else that I'm going to talk about. Thinking global. We always think about domestic market. I live in the UK, I sell to the UK, I make my money in the UK. 
But we're a global world. This is Gen Y. This is Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, MySpace. Well, not MySpace anymore, because that's for losers. Uh, but you, you get the picture, right? It's all about connectivity. And I started to think, well, you know, maybe, maybe the UK isn't such a big place. Maybe there are a few places outside that might want to buy some chocolate. So I started getting in touch with the government. I'd already had a little bit of contact with local members of parliament, local governors, and I got in top contact with UK Trade and Investment, the agency for export in the UK. And it started out small, you know, with a little bit of Eastern Europe, France, Belgium, the kind of places that you would normally think about. And this is a story I want to bring to you. Age of 17, I'm doing a little bit of business abroad. I go and see a customer. In the UK, I spend two hours with that customer, two hours, and they buy one case of chocolate bars, one. Then I fly to New York the next week. I spend 15 minutes with a buyer, 15 minutes, and they order four pallets. All right, that's six and a half thousand bars on each pallet. Four pallets, straight away. And that opened my eyes. The world's a big place. And however big your country feels, however much you're concentrating on domestic market, you have to realize that sometimes your business idea is too advanced for your own country. Sometimes the market isn't big enough. But it doesn't mean that there's not a market for you somewhere else. So for all of you sitting here today, I want you to think, you know, hopefully we've given you some ideas of whether you want to be an entrepreneur, what I call an intrapreneur, the mindset of success in, in an average career. But please, think global. This is the dawn of the global age of business. It is more important now than ever. It is getting easier to trade than ever. I spend time in countries all around the world. I'm now a government consultant for the British government. I work with the British Council and UK Trade and Investment. Um, I'm just about to go on my first trade uh, mission to Mexico um, at the end of this year with the UK Prime Minister. And that's another thing. Much as Savril said, people is power. So when I started out in business, I got to know a lot of people in my industry. I grew my network very quickly. But I will tell you right now that most of what I did, most of the continued success, the growth in my business, and especially abroad, is all about getting to know the right people, one to the other. And eventually, you get to the top. When I deal with supermarkets, I don't deal with one buyer. I deal with the commercial director or the CEO. I know the CEO of Sainsbury's, the CEO of Waitrose, and all my other customers. And because of that link with the British government, it's knowing, and this is another thing, this is dangerous for Gen Y to be talking about this, but I want to tell you a word that you won't like. It's called politics. And it's something that has to be involved in business. You have to understand that if you're ever going to grow your business, grow foreign markets, we as Gen Y finally have the power to say something about politics. If we ever want to change our world, if we ever want to change our business community, you have to get involved now. Don't moan about it. A lot of people in the UK you say, oh, politics, oh, rubbish. <laughs> Don't moan unless you've done something about it. I, little old me, I've changed three laws in the UK now to do with export. Three, and I'm 20 years old. I'm the first person ever in British history, in Parliament, to sit in Parliament in a full debate in a pair of jeans. <laughs> the first person ever. I'm the first person to meet Princess Anne, Prince Charles and go to Clarence House in a pair of jeans. This is Gen Y. We can change things. So I want to leave you with a, a few points. You know, as Savile said, it's, it's the passion, it's the motivation. You have to know where you want to go. But you also have to understand that it's a big world out there. It's huge. It's about your product, it's about your service, the best ingredients, the best people create the best success. As of February 2012, I, okay, a long time ago, you remember the goal I set to be one of the best chocolatiers in the world? Big goal, huge. February 2012, 
I became a member of the World Chocolate Ambassadors Club. I am now one of only 39 of the world's most qualified chocolatiers. I beat the age by 20 years, and not only that, I'm the only ambassador, the only one that understands chocolate to a molecular level and full industrial customers. So not only did I beat it by age, I beat it by knowledge. You have to know about your industry, and with knowledge comes power. I went away, I studied marketing, I studied fashion, everything that touched my industry. I had an interest in, I, seek, I went out to seek the knowledge, to know the people in the industry. The reason I couldn't be here for the launch event, I was in Germany, I'm now a consultant for Kodak, and I was sitting on the stage with Antonia Brez, their CEO. At 20 years old, I am a consultant to companies as big as Kodak and the British government. Age is never a barrier, it's just a number, it doesn't matter. So, remember everyone, Satu Malaysia! Let's, let's use Gen Y to unite the generation. Let's use social networking and our spirit to change politics for the better. Malaysia Bolay! Ladies and gentlemen, once more for Mr. Louis Barnett. By the time I get home, I'm going to publish the second book, If, you can, if I Can, You Can, in Malaysia. So please, if you have any questions, I know it's difficult to ask them now. If you see on, my, uh, on, on the slide there, please get out your phones, add me on Twitter, add me on Facebook. If you don't want to ask a question in the audience, just tweet me. And hopefully, if you ask a good enough question, I'll put it in my book and your name. So how about that? So make sure you add me on Facebook and Twitter. So, any questions from anybody? Was that a hand raised over there? No? I, um, Louis, I have one question. Your, your recipe, it said on there, it's not what we put in, it's what we leave out. Or was it the other? Anyway, do you have things like a copyright on your chocolate recipe? It's, it's, it's very difficult to, to get a copyright on, on recipes, unless it's a uh, sort of a brand new molecular um, status of, of recipe but really what I, what I try and push across is I'm always seeking out the most innovative ingredients in my industry. I'm always seeking out new suppliers, new flavours, new concepts. So, it, you know, a lot of people have copied me. I started making an edit, when I was talking about chocolate boxes, it was actually a box made out of chocolate. The lid, the base, everything. That's been copied all over the world. You can find it in, in Mexico, in America. All over the world people copied me. But by the time they'd copied me, I was already two years down the line with 30 new products. So, especially in physical products, it's very difficult to get patents. It's very difficult to select IP. But it's always been that step ahead. The innovation, the constant progress in your marketing and your development as a, com as a company. Thank you. What is the meaning of success in your life? And uh, to me, it's quite an uh, individual question. Do you know you have to get a receipt from the community? Do you want to come, sir? Sir, can you come, come back to, to the microphone? That's right, we, it's, just, it's always good to be there because if you need to repeat a question, <laughs> so, okay, first of all, Saturday, I repeat the question. Sorry. What is the meaning of success uh, in your life? What is the meaning of success? Uh, I know, I got the question for Louis, but we need to wear the question. Okay, for Louis, <laughs> you have a chance to talk to me. So I want to take this to you. He wants a sample. So do we all. It's different, defined differently for different people. Because I grew up in a very, very poor community in London. For someone to even just set up a business is considered success. For someone to do something which is different is considered success. But being from an Asian background, a lot of people in my family think because I have not gone to university, I don't have a degree. 
My uncle still thinks I'm unsuccessful because I don't have a degree. But doing everything I've done, from the businesses I set up, to the people I've, the lives I've changed, to the books I've written, to the games I've created, to the TV shows I've hosted, all these things, if you add up, now I think that outweighs just getting a degree. Because a degree, you're studying for the two, three years, at the end of the day, you take an exam and you're judged on that one exam you take on that day. You may have a bad day and you're off. For me, I think it's success is defined differently for different people, but I consider myself to be on. Yes, I've been successful, but I've got a lot more to achieve. So it's different. You know, a lot of people might be born and raised in a family which is well off. You know, who's got multi millions of pounds, you know. And if their son is just earning a few, few hundred here and there, to them, success isn't the same level. But success isn't also defined by money. It's also defined by how you feel, the outcome of your vision. So it's defined differently for different people. But that, that, for me, I would consider myself on my way to achieving greater success, but I can also consider myself successful you know, within my own community as well. Thank you. Mine's going to be quite a short answer about the sample. Um, you can have one when they're in the country. I haven't really brought many with me, but, but tweet me. I'll favourite it, and I will send you a sample when we've got some in the country. Thank you. Twitter, okay? Twitter's power. Louis Barnett, tweet me. You never know what might happen. And just to add a really quick point to Savril, um, I've always found with success in what I do, um, it's taking time to kind of treat yourself to a little bit of success along the way. So it's not waiting till you get an award or a medal or money or whatever it is that you want to get to. You know, I set out my goal of being one of the world's most qualified chocolatiers. It took me eight and a half years. But there was a lot of little successes in between. So it's taken that time to sit there and understand what you've done every day. What have I done today? You know, one of the things I want to leave you with, and whether this translates very well, I hope it does. Because I say this every single night before I go to bed. I was very close to my grandfather when I was young. And I took a lot of inspiration from him. And he used to sit every night and look at me, look me straight in the eyes and say, Louis, if you don't wake tomorrow, if tonight you take your last breath, you don't wake up in the morning, are you happy with what you've done in this life? Because if you're not, you better start changing things. Wise words. Oh. Hi, Louis. Uh, I want to ask you, how did you handle rejection? What's keeping you on the track? I think re rejection is one of those things that we get, you know, we, we get used to. And rejection for me was very, very familiar. I got rejected at school a lot. I got rejected from the education system. And I think, like I said, actually it's turning a negative into a positive. The, the, the more times you do something wrong, the less time it's going to take you to do it right. You know, Albert Einstein... Uh, so I'm terrible with names. Very famous inventor once said, I learned how, Thomas Edison, I learned how to make, uh, make the light bulb 7,000 times the wrong way, but I made it right one way. So it's always about taking that rejection in a good way and thinking, looking at it, it might take you a couple of days, sometimes it might take months. You have to look at that experience and think, what can I learn from that? What went wrong? Why was I rejected? Is it, is it the product? Is it, was it my presentation? What was it? Why did I get rejected? And that's very important. It's all about learning from your mistakes. As I said before, you'll only ever be as successful as your biggest mistake. People ask me how did I learn how to employ staff. I employed a lot of bad staff and learned from that. Excellent.